Tonight's speaker is historian Bruce Tucker, who presents lectures and classes on a wide variety of subjects in American and world history to lifelong learning and adult students at colleges and universities, synagogues, business meetings, history clubs, such as ours, and throughout senior centers in New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Delaware. He holds a, he, well, he's currently teaching history, political science, and film classes at Rutgers University School of Continuing Education. Ed Asher Lifelong Learning Institute. He holds a BA in history, political science from City University of New York, and a master's degree, I'm sorry, a master's of science degree in information systems and project management from Stevens Institute in Hoboken, New Jersey. He's also a living historian. He does Commodore Uriah Levy. For those of you who don't know, he was the first Jewish Commodore in the United States Navy about 1812. And he also does Admiral Farragut. So without further ado, ding, 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 Admiral, United States Navy arriving. Thank you very much. That was a very good imitation of a real bell. All right, well, I'm uh, sorry for the, uh, the delay in getting started here uh, this evening. Um, I, uh, I'm going to welcome, for, welcome you, first of all, aboard uh, my flagship, the USS Hartford. I'm in my cabin, uh, currently docked at the Brooklyn Navy Yard in New York City. And uh, I understand that you uh, are interested in getting uh, a little information about the recent actions that I participated in at Mobile Bay. Uh, I'm advised by my uh, chief engineer and also Captain uh, Drayton, who commands the Hartford, that this strange contraption I'm staring into is going to allow you to see my presence and hear my voice. Uh, I guess something along the lines of a magic window from uh, Mr. Lewis Carroll's fiction, Alice in Wonderland. Um, seems to me that some contraption like this ought to be in Mr. Barnum's museum, not too far away from where I am right now. But I digress a bit and let me focus on the presentation that you have requested. Uh, my sweet wife, Virginia, is always astonished that anyone would be interested in any information about my experiences at sea. She, of course, has heard much about them over the years, the many, many letters that I've written home uh, when I'm away at sea. Um, first and foremost, let me say that I'm somewhat uncomfortable uh, being called the hero of Mobile Bay. Uh, in my humble opinion, I really did nothing more than uh, I pledged to do as a young boy of 10 entering the Naval Service nearly 50 years ago. I take no particular pleasure um, in this work of fighting and trying to kill men who I once considered friends and brother officers. And I take some comfort in the occasional success we may bring to bring this war to an end. I know that uh, President Lincoln shares my feelings about this. And uh, I, uh, I, I certainly hope that this, this madness will, will end soon as a result of uh, some of the actions that um, my officers and I have taken recently. Let's see. Um, I think also I wanted to talk about the fact that uh, many people speak about the, um, the illustrations you may have seen in the local newspapers of, uh, of, my, of my presence up in the uh, rigging of the ship. Uh, and uh, sort of looking as if I was posing for a painting. And I understand there are some people that are actually making paintings of this illustration. I find all of this really nonsense. I was doing my job and nothing more than that. And there were certainly dangers involved in, in that, but uh, that's part of the job, as you say. Uh, the last thing I also wanna talk about is what, I, what I'm quoted to have said at the famous Battle of Mobile Bay, that is damn the torpedoes, and uh, full speed ahead. Uh, I'll give you the exact wording if you like. Uh, it wasn't exactly quite that way. Uh, to begin with, uh, Mobile Bay, some of you may, may or may not realize was the last major port uh, that the rebels are holding and uh, part of the assignment that I was given back in uh, 1862 to, to capture the, uh, the port of New Orleans and also to close the port of Mobile. Well, New Orleans was uh, not exactly a cakewalk as some folks would say and uh, Mobile Bay was certainly a challenge as well. Um, I think unfortunately, uh, Mobile Bay took a lot longer than, uh, than, than most folks expected it to take. 
Um, part of the reason why it took as long as it did was the, uh, the, the actions that the rebels took to fortify the, uh, the forts that guard uh, Mobile Bay and uh, the technology that has advanced uh, in the uh, years since the war began have created some, uh, some challenges for the Navy. To close the port of Mobile requires capturing three forts, Fort Powell, Fort Gaines, and most, most importantly, Fort Morgan. And these forts have um, somewhere between 30 and 40 guns apiece, and they face across the water entrances to the port of Mobile. And uh, in addition to that hazard, there is also the, or there was also the uh, rebel ironclad that was, has been constructed over a number of years, the, uh, the Tennessee, which was captured uh, during my action at Mobile Bay and is now part of the, uh, the, the uh, Naval fleet. Uh, to meet this challenge, I had to draw up a plan uh, and uh, not all that different than plan that I put together to capture New Orleans. Um, some unusual tactics, uh, many of my brother officers felt at the time. Uh, I based it on the intelligence that was being gathered from spies in the area that would uh, report about the number and type of guns that were located at the forts that I was going to have to pass in addition to the torpedo fields that were being laid uh, in the entrances uh, to, to the bay and uh, having to deal with those things. Uh, dangerous contraptions, uh, these torpedoes, uh, they, uh, for those of you who are un unaware, torpedoes are, um, you, know, you, could, you could use uh, basically a, a large keg, uh, one that would uh, hold uh, maybe 50 or 100 gallons of liquid uh, instead of being uh, liquid, it would be held with uh, powder and with a fuse and with a contact exploder, such that if the side of the ship were to uh, come up against one of these uh, contact detonators, uh, the, the wooden so hulls of the ships would essentially be obliterated and the ships would sink. And that was the fate that was awaiting uh, any ship that would stray into these torpedo fields. So it was extremely important for me to be aware of where these fields were, and then I have to have some knowledge of how long those torpedoes had been in the water. Uh, the longer those torpedoes are in the water, depending on how well they are uh, proofed of water, uh, would determine how effective they might be. And this was something that I also had to take uh, into consideration. Um, now, in addition to uh, the naval forces that I was going to have to compile uh, in order to achieve this, this, uh, this goal, uh, there was also going to be a need to work closely with the Army, and for that uh, partner I had, and very grateful to his assistance and support, General Granger, who uh, had initially a force of almost 5,000 men, uh, and that, that was supposed to augment uh, my forces uh, in order to capture the port of Mobile. Uh, he was working at a disadvantage because not too long before the action took place, uh, General Grant had taken about 3,000 of his 5,000 man force and moved them elsewhere where he, General Grant felt that they were needed. Uh, needless to say, even though uh, General Granger was operating with a reduction in force, he was still able to accomplish the capture of uh, Fort Powell, uh, which would mean that the other two forts, Morgan and Gaines, would be the ones that I would have to deal with directly with my naval force. Um, as I had done at uh, New Orleans, and I'm sure many of you may have read about that in the newspapers. Uh, I, I came up with a tactic of uh, pairs of ships entering the, the waterways as we pass the forts that were guarding those waterways. And the uh, idea behind that was so that if a ship were to become incapacitated, the second ship or the paired ship, which would be lashed to the initial ship, would be able to continue motion. Uh, a ship that stands still before a, a, a gun fort is basically a sitting duck, as some people would say, and is certainly going to be sunk in its place. You know, the important thing is to keep moving and to keep firing, uh, to keep the gunners that are firing at you away from their guns as much as possible and uh, mass as much firepower uh, to affect that as possible. So I had used that tactic successfully in New Orleans two years ago. And I employed that same tactic again this time. The only difference that uh, I made in the, uh, in the makeup of the ships, and this is part of the reason why it took many months before we were able to actually affect 
this attack was I also wanted to have four ironclad warships uh, in addition to my sailing steam warships that would be coming through the passes into Mobile Bay. The reason for this, as we have learned over the, the last two years, ironclad warships such as the famous Monitor and the Sisters of the Monitor that have been built since then, uh, being clad in iron are very much resistant to shell and shock. And so they can take a tremendous amount of punishment. I wanted the forts to be concentrating on these ironclads as they came in to expend as much of their ammunition as possible and to wear out the gun crews as much as possible so that when my sailing ships, which would follow those ironclads in, would be passing under those same guns, they would be that much less reduced in firepower and ability. In addition, once those ironclad warships had passed that position, they could then turn their turrets, which uniquely rotate in ways that a, uh, a broadside gun warship would not be able to do, would turn their guns and be able to provide what is called flanking fire or enfilade fire uh, from the sides and the directions of which the forts could not turn their guns as they were all in fixed positions uh, in the forts that I would be passing. The steam power of the sloops that were lashed to my ships would, as I had said previously, would maintain the motion of the ships as they would pass into Mobile Bay. Now, this was all part of the plan, but as I'm sure you understand, plans don't always go exactly as they are intended. And this was the case. Uh, as the monitors were entering the port of Mobile and passing under the guns of Fort Gaines, the lead monitor, which was the USS Tecumseh, unfortunately, reacting to the position of the ironclad Tennessee, sought to block the Tennessee from a, being able to fire upon my squadron as it entered Mobile Bay. In so doing, unfortunately, the captain of the Tennessee took his ship, took, of the captain of the Tecumseh, took his ship into, and unfortunately far too close to where we already knew the torpedo fields that the rebels had laid were. And unfortunately, one of those torpedoes did as it was intended and detonated. And the detonation caused the Tecumseh to sink rather rapidly, taking a good portion of its crew with it. I have to say to the credit of the rebel commander at Fort Morgan, that when the commander saw what happened just below his guns, he ordered his gunners to stop so that my crew members could go down and pick up the survivors of the unfortunate Tecumseh. Having, having witnessed this, the lead ship in my squadron, which was the USS Brooklyn under the command of Captain Alden, realized that there was a problem ahead, saw the Tecumseh sink and was concerned about his own vessel striking another torpedo in the same field. He slowed and ultimately stopped his vessel before the line of ships that were following, which included my own flagship, the Hartford, right behind the Brooklyn. Now, all the communication that goes on between ships is basically either by signal flag or by voice tube. And, and these things are both challenged in the heat of a battle with all of the smoke that emanates from all of the guns that are being fired on both sides. So this is where my... Uh, climb into the rigging comes into the story. Um, and it's not an unusual thing for a commander of a ship to climb up into the rigging to get a better view of what's going on so that one knows what to do when the plan goes awry as this one was going. So I started to slowly climb up those rat lines as high up as what is uh, known in, in, in uh, at least in, again, uh, I'll explain the technology here, a fighting top. A fighting top is a platform that sits about a third of the way up the mast, and it is usually where Marines might be assigned and other members of the crew uh, who need to have visibility to be able to see the enemy from that height. I was about half the distance to that uh, platform uh, when I stopped and uh, used my glass to be able to see above the smoke and the haze to see what was going on ahead. Voice tubes were communicating information back to me from the Brooklyn. And what I heard was from Captain Alden that he, uh, he yelled that there were torpedoes ahead. He also had stopped his ship almost dead in the water and was creating uh, something of a hazard for the ships that would be following. 
If I didn't act upon this immediately within a matter of a minute or two, uh, disaster would have occurred because all of the ships would have piled up into one position right below the guns of Fort Morgan and they most likely would have sunk right there in that channel. The decision I had to make was to proceed regardless of the risk that potentially existed in the torpedo field ahead of me that obviously, at least in the case, unfortunate case of the Tecumseh was working. I had to take a chance that perhaps that was a rogue torpedo that went off and that the rest of them would not detonate in the same manner. So this is where my, uh, my command at this point, which I'll break down for you into portions. Start, it started off with torpedoes be damned. And there was a pause at that point not an immediate response after that. I called down to ca the captain of the Hartford and I said to, to uh, Captain Drayton, full speed. And then I looked across over my left shoulder at the ship that was lashed to mine. And I called over to the captain of that ship who is the, whose name was Joette, Lieutenant Joette. And I said, four bells, go ahead. And what I was telling him was to proceed at full speed right along with our ship so that both of the ships would be in tandem and one would not get ahead of the other as we proceeded past Fort Morgan and into the oncoming torpedo field and beyond it, the rebel ironclad Tennessee waiting for us. So at this point, the squadron is proceeding. The Brooklyn has now uh, come back into the, into the fight and is following the rest of the squadron into Mobile Bay. The ironclads that survived this initial assault, the other three ironclads that survived the assault were now turning their guns on Fort Morgan and keeping those guns away, uh, keeping those gunners away from their guns and therefore not firing upon the squadron as it was moving past those guns. So slowly but surely over a period of about 30 minutes, most of the squadron made it into the lower portion of Mobile Bay. What was waiting for us inside the bay, of course, was that ironclad, the Tennessee, and three gunboats that were, you could say, consorts of the, of the ironclad gunboat. The gunboats that were waiting for us were smaller, lighter, and they immediately turned to attack the, uh, the squadron as we entered. As soon as this occurred, uh, Lieutenant Joette and some of the other, the other officers of the other gunboats that were lashed to our sloops requested permission to break those connections so that they could chase after those rebel gunboats and capture them. And I, of course, immediately gave them the approval to do so. However, the ironclad Tennessee had other ideas. It decided that it was going to single-handedly sink my squadron. Now, I know, from again, from intelligence that the commander of the Tennessee was none, under, none other than my old friend, uh, Admiral Buchanan of the Rebel Navy, who I knew, of course, in the old Navy. In fact, uh, Admiral Buchanan at, for, at one point had served as the commandant at the Naval Academy for a few years. We were friends back then, but unfortunately the war changed all of that. He was now going to try to sink me and sink my fleet. I was of course not going to have any part of that, and I had superior firepower at my disposal, which he did not. So what ensued was pretty much a melee of the vessels of my squadron uh, reacting to the Tennessee, attacking it, and sometimes banging into each other in their attempt to reach the Tennessee. The real difference that was made as far as the Tennessee was concerned was not so much my ships, but once again, those three remaining ironclads that had made it into the, into the lower portion of the bay now concentrated their firepower on the ironclad Tennessee. And one in, one in particular uh, fired numerous shots at the stern of the Tennessee where the anchor chains and the, and the rudder chains uh, were located. Now, this was probably a mistake as far as the builders were concerned. Uh, the rebels were very resourceful in being able to take whatever material that they could get uh, in order to build ironclads in the first place. Iron was a scarce resource for the South and they needed to concentrate as much of their iron, re iron building or iron founding resources as possible to be able to make these monsters. And unfortunately, because they uh, were uh, hasty in their design, 
they exposed these very critical points of the Tennessee to fire. And my, uh, my, the captains of these, these ironclads uh, were well trained to look for the weaknesses in their adversaries and very quickly realized that the, the uh, rudder chains on the Tennessee would be a very advantageous target to go after. And so they did. And so ultimately, uh, after firing numerous rounds at the uh, stern end of the Tennessee, the, those chains were broken and the rudders were made useless and the Tennessee basically became a floating hulk and target. In the, in the middle of all of that, uh, some of the rounds that were being fired um, at the Tennessee by the USS Winnebago, by the way, which was one of those three uh, ironclads, uh, one of those rounds went right through one of the gun ports of the Tennessee and severely injured uh, Admiral Buchanan. Uh, I found out about this later uh, after the battle was over and uh, the Tennessee had rendered its surrender to me. Uh, Admiral Buchanan was so badly injured that he couldn't personally uh, surrender his vessel to me. I was advised by his executive officer, uh, Commander Johnston, uh, who I also knew from the old Navy uh, and came, came aboard the, uh, the Hartford to render the, uh, the surrender of the Tennessee to me. Uh, he told me that he was uh, quite embarrassed to be in my presence uh, in this particular circumstance. Uh, but I, uh, I tried to make him feel uh, as comfortable as possible and make sure that he got something to eat. I told him to uh, advise Admiral Buchanan that if he needed any assistance, we would uh, certainly render it to him and get him whatever medical treatment um, he needed. Um, once this action was completed, and I have to say that it was a, a very, very bloody action indeed, uh, in spite of the fact that we were able to get past the forts uh, relatively uh, undamaged, uh, I cannot say that, uh, that there were a few casualties. There were a significant number of casualties, uh, many sailors that were injured uh, on the decks and in the rigging. Uh, in spite of the precautions that uh, we took to try to avoid as much of those casualties as possible. Part of my preparations involved making sure that there was sand on the decks to put out fires should they start and that there was uh, a lot of uh, webbing and a lot of uh, material that could be used to protect the sailors from shrapnel wounds that they would receive uh, from the shells that the rebel forts were firing uh, many of the rounds that the rebel forts were firing were explo explosive shells, not simply uh, solid shot cannonballs, and uh, the shrapnel from those shells uh, could tear a man literally limb from limb. And uh, consequently, the decks of the Hartford, uh, when the action was over, uh, were running red uh, with the blood of the sailors under my command, and it certainly had a, a, a large effect upon me. I, uh, I, weep, I wept openly uh, on the deck. I was not ashamed of my officers to see uh, because uh, this was a tremendous loss of life and a tremendous sacrifice that was being made uh, for the sake of the Union. Um, I considered myself quite lucky to have survived the action uh, in spite of uh, where I stood, whether it was up in the rigging or down on the deck. Certainly, uh, it was a very dangerous action and uh, many sailors uh, paid their, uh, their lives uh, in this action to, uh, to close the port of Mobile. Mobile itself, um, as, a, as a target, uh, once the forts were uh, subdued, uh, was really no longer an effective port for the rebels because with the port closed, it was only a matter of time before the city of Mobile would ultimately be uh, subdued by, uh, by, by army troops um, as they would march up along either the uh, uh, the right or left sides of the, um, of the bay itself. The forts themselves fell to the army troops within a day or two. Uh, I've always felt that uh, army troops are much better at capturing fortresses once they've been subdued, uh, once they can no longer receive the supplies that they need. Uh, again, this was something that uh, I learned uh, significantly at the uh, New Orleans operation, that once a fort is, uh, is surrounded, once they can no longer receive a food, medical supplies, and most importantly for them, any additional ammunition or powder that they might need to be able to fight with. There was basically no reason for them to continue. And uh, it was a simple matter for them to surrender to the troops that were surrounding them. And this is what ultimately happened. 
to Fort Morgan and Fort Gaines and Fort Howell. All three of those forts uh, were captured the same way as Fort Jackson was uh, in New Orleans two years ago. I don't know uh, how much of the detail of this was uh, reported or made clear to you um, in the newspapers that, re that reported the story. Uh, there were many reporters um, after the, uh, the, the action took place that were asking many, many questions of myself and the other officers that were there. We, of course, had to write reports up for the Navy Department, as that is a, a, a general requirement in all cases. Uh, and uh, the details are, not, are never spared in any of these things in terms of uh, the actions that took place, the individuals that were involved in the actions and the praise that is worthy in my particular case uh, I had significant praise to make for all of my officers, for all of the, the uh, Army personnel, General Granger, and all of the officers under my command, and all of the Marines uh, under my command, who uh, maintained the integrity and the safety as much as humanly possible uh, for our ships as we passed through these dangerous, dangerous passages below these rebel forts. And uh, there, at this point, are very few other places uh, that can operate uh, to provide for supplies to continue this war. And that is ultimately the goal of the Navy's blockade, which I have been supporting since the beginning of the war as the West, the West Gulf Coast uh, commander. Uh, that was my responsibility, uh, maintaining the blockade and also closing these ports. The actions at New Orleans and the actions at Mobile Bay have been a tremendous uh, physical strain upon me. Uh, and and uh, so uh, even though uh, I, was, uh, I was highly praised by the Navy Department and by Secretary Wells and the president, given a, uh, a promotion, uh, I, have, I feel that uh, rest is required and I, uh, I requested that. And uh, Secretary Wells very gratefully granted that relief to me. Uh, and so it will be, it will, fall, it will fall to another officer to close the port of Wilmington, which is the, uh, the next port uh, that uh, needs to be closed before we can ultimately conclude uh, this, this horrible war. And uh, all of this in support of General Grant's troops and his ability to, uh, to chase General Lee down and capture the, the Army of Virginia and any other forces that are continuing to oppose the integrity and honor and respect of our union. And uh, that's, uh, that's the story that uh, I wanted to impart to you. I hope that uh, it was interesting to you. Uh, I hope that I, that I did not uh, bore you with too many facts, uh, but uh, that, is, that is the story as it was. And certainly uh, if any of you have any questions that you would like to ask of me, uh, I will be only too happy to uh, respond to them. Uh, nothing of a personal nature, of course, uh, but uh, by all means, if you have any questions, uh, only too happy to answer them. Thank you. Admiral, I'll go ahead and lead off with the questions, um, and I'm sure the membership will have it as well. But I, I have to ask you, when you went into what you knew for a fact was an active minefield, that had already sunk in minutes one of your best ships. Do you now consider yourself the luckiest naval officer ever? And how can we be more like you? Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I think the answer to that is absolutely. I, I believe I believe I am extremely lucky. I believe that uh, in that particular instance, and just about any action that I've ever been involved with. Um, as a naval officer, and not and certainly not just the ones involving this current conflict, but in any conflict I've ever been in, I've always been rather lucky. In fact, uh, I have written that uh, many, many times to my wife and to my son over the years, uh, but probably not more so than the actions uh, at Mobile Bay, uh, particularly uh, in the heat of the fight. Uh, it was certainly, uh, I think, clear that uh, I was extremely lucky. Yes. Admiral, thank you for speaking to us this evening and for your service to our country. I'm wondering if you could tell us a bit about your relationship with, I believe, your half-brother, Admiral David Dixon Porter, and was there any sibling rivalry between you during the war? Well, David, uh, David and I have, have had our differences over the years on various things, not all of them involving uh, naval actions. 
uh, but uh, we 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 are we are brothers, and uh, we I think that in uh, in most cases we uh, we try to look out for each other. Uh, the one occasion that uh, I felt um, I felt that David uh, took a little bit of an advantage um, of our relationship was uh, not really at uh, at Mobile Bay, but uh, two years ago uh, with respect to New Orleans. Uh, when I was first uh, asked if, uh, if uh, when I was first asked about the uh, potential assignment to close uh, the port of New Orleans, um, I was not told it was going to be New Orleans. Uh, I was told that potentially it might be Norfolk that I would be closing. Uh, and uh, my response, whether it was a surprise to David or not, uh, was, was uh, that I would, I would do my duty as I am asked to do as an officer of the Navy. And uh, I've made it, I made a pledge long ago to do so and to honor the flag. And I continue to do that now, uh, re re regardless of uh, whatever personal feelings I might have or whatever personal relationships that I might have made over the years. And that was essentially my response. Now, David seemed a little surprised that I was comfortable with doing this because he knew that I had many friends living in, in Norfolk at the time, and that a lot, of those, a lot of those individuals would very much likely have been injured um, in that action. Uh, but uh, my response was so strong to David that uh, he immediately reported that back to, uh, to Secretary Wells. And um, I believe it was a very uh, influential in Secretary Wells deciding that I was the officer that was the right officer to be assigned to take New Orleans. And uh, not too long after that, um, that's what occurred. So uh, I could say that my relationship with David, uh, my relationship with my brother uh, has been one that's afforded me opportunity in that particular case, um, he may perhaps maybe didn't think I was going to uh, to bite the donut, as one might say. But um, but uh, I had no problems um, not only biting the donut but consuming it wholly. So, <laughs> the, tor the torpedo fields that you mentioned. Yes. Once set, how much maintenance did the South? Give to those torpedo fields. Were they diligent in that regard, or were they negligent, or were they what's that? Just yes, it's a very it's a very good question, uh, and uh, I didn't really give the detail in my in my uh, presentation, but I'm glad that you asked. Um, as part of the intelligence work that was being done, and again talking about, there were many many months that preceded the action of August the fifth, eighteen sixty four. And a lot of that involved uh, intelligence work. A lot of it was not just spies, but also uh, actually sending out uh, small uh, scouting parties in small boats uh, in and around the areas where the torpedoes were laid. Now, the rebels, when they laid those torpedoes, first of all, there was a channel that was left untorpedoed. And the whole idea behind that was so that they're blockading sh the, the ships that were running the blockade, the blockade runners would be able to come in and out of those locations uh, and would not have to worry about running into the, the torpedoes themselves. This is the reason why the torpedo field was clearly marked. You might say, well, why would they mark them if they, if they were you know, concerned about us not you know, running into them or not running into them? They were clearly marked not for us, they were clearly marked for the rebels blockade runners. So we knew where they were, they knew where they were uh, at all times. What was an unknown was what was the condition of those torpedoes. Now, what we were able to surmise from the intelligence gathering that we did was, uh, and to answer your question, very little maintenance was done on those torpedoes once they had been laid. Okay? And because of that, there was an understanding that some of those torpedoes would not remain uh, without being waterlogged, without, without having water damage, without allowing water to seep into those powder kegs, rendering essentially them useless, uh, but still formidable looking, right? So one cannot, one cannot tell whether a, a torpedo is going to detonate or not simply by looking at it, but close, close inspection, might give you some clues as to not whether it's 
going to explode or not, but whether anyone's done any maintenance on them or not. And the intelligence information that had been gathered for me, what had been brought to my attention, was simply the fact that it didn't appear that the rebels were doing very much maintenance on those torpedoes. And that is what I had in my mind when I had to make what many people would call a split second decision about whether to go ahead or not. The alternative to going ahead was to, to my mind in that instance, far worse than, uh, than, than the, other, the other direction. So uh, I, I made the calculated risk that uh, we should proceed and that the odds were in our favor. And Providence proved me to be correct. Could it have gone the other way? Certainly it could have gone the other way. There might've been a few more of those torpedoes that weren't waterlogged that we might've run into that might've sunk some or more of the ships of my squadron, but Providence was with me. And it turned out to just be that single one that did the most damage, unfortunately, to the Tecumseh. But intelligence gathering is a critical part of, of any action before you go ahead, you've got to know what you're dealing with. The, uh, the, famous, Chi the famous Chinese uh, uh, general uh, Sun Tzu had said, know your enemy. And I knew my enemy very well. I'd worked with many of them before the war and I understood, I understood the tactics and I understood the technology. And so intelligence gathering to me and preparation was extremely important. Um, the two most successful uh, generals on the Union side were Grant and Sherman. Yes. And they were also the most successful in dealing with the Navy. Yes. Um, Grant primarily on the Mississippi and Sherman in his Carolina campaign. And I believe it's a lot of why they were so successful was his cooperation with the Navy. Why didn't the other generals cooperate with you? Well, that's, that's as a Navy man, that's of course a hard question for me to answer, but <laughs> I, I, could, I can tell you truthfully that uh, the, the relationship that I've had with General Grant and General Sherman and General Granger, uh, warm relationships with all three gentlemen uh, I think that uh, my, my relationship with General Grant, which began two years ago uh, on the Mississippi River, as we uh, sought to subdue uh, the fortress of Vicksburg, uh, and my, uh, my, my, my stepbrother, David, was very much involved in that operation as well. I had the, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, uh, good graces to uh, have General Grant as my guest aboard my ship um, in the Mississippi River. And we had occasion to uh, spend a lot of time together talking about tactics and about ways that the Navy and the Army could operate more often together. It is unfortunate that at, shall we say, higher levels, uh, up, shall we say, in the level of the cabinet, that uh, the same uh, camaraderie does not exist. However, fortunate it is that uh, commanders at a lower level that have the latitude to operate independently of those directions uh, can, uh, can often achieve greater success uh, by putting their forces together, by coordinating their forces in such a way that uh, it is advantageous to both sides. General Grant learned very early on uh, the value of naval artillery, the value of movable naval artillery on waterways. Waterways are the highways of the country and the way that logistics operates the way that troops move, the way that equipment moves, and having mobile artillery, um, as very often the Navy can provide, can, always, can very often be the difference between victory and defeat, as was the case, I believe, in the Shiloh campaign. So yes, absolutely, there is a tremendous amount of advantage to working uh, closely with our, uh, our naval brothers, uh, our army brothers, pardon the, uh, pardon the pun. Well, Admiral, uh, congratulations on your victories. Thank you, uh, sir. I'm curious, did you use mortar barges to soften up the rebel forts? We did that at, uh, at uh, New Orleans uh, significantly. And that was, uh, again, something that uh, my, my stepbrother, David, David Porter, 
Uh, he, uh, he was, uh, uh, as part of when, he, in the early stages of the assault on New Orleans, uh, was uh, very adamant that uh, using, mortar, using mortar barges would be uh, helpful uh, in softening up the defenses for Fort Jackson and ultimately taking the port of New Orleans. And uh, he was absolutely correct um, in, that, in that assumption. I'm quite sure that the, the fort was not as well uh, equipped or as well prepared to deal with the passing of my squadron as a result of being bombarded by those mortar ships uh, in a few, the few days that preceded our attack um, on those forts and then proceeding up to, uh, to close the port of New Orleans. So uh, mortar boats um, and, and very, very valuable contribution to the overall success of the operation, as much so I think as the ironclads were at Mobile Bay. Congratulations, Admiral, with being the first flag officer in the US Navy. Um, during the 1820s, when the literal bulk of the US Navy was on anti-slavery patrol off the west coast of Africa, what exactly were you doing in the US Navy at that time? Well, back then I was assigned to one of the, one of the frigates and uh, it, was, it was part of our responsibility to track down these uh, the ships that were violating the, uh, the slavery laws. And uh, we did capture a few of these vessels and, uh, and, and we had to uh, you know, make sure that the, the, the individuals on board were returned to where or whence they, uh, they came. Uh, slavery is, a, is a, of course the issue that we are currently engaged um, in our war now. And, uh, and, and it's uh, certainly, uh, I think once the war is over, um, probably going to be decided. I know that uh, this is something that's very important to President Lincoln um, from his uh, emancipation proclamation. And uh, I'm pretty sure that if he is reelected and I hope he is reelected in the fall uh, that he will probably continue to pursue that. Um, but uh, yes, very early on in my Naval career, I was involved in, in hunting down slave ships and, and, uh, and capturing them and uh, turning them over to justice. Sir, uh, during that operation, uh, during the 1820s, I have read that you coordinated, meaning the US Navy coordinated with the Royal Navy by assigning a single Naval officer to the British ships and the British ships would assign a single Naval officer to the US Navy ships. At yes. which point the slavers who would see an American ship coming would immediately change their flags to the uh, English flags. Yes. By having this English officer aboard, it would be much easier than you could run them down and then have the English officer take control of the contraband, the slaves that were on board. Did you have any part in doing that? I wish I could say that I did, but at that at that time in my career, um, uh, you could you could say that was above my pay grade uh, to, to be able to, to be able to accomplish. Uh, I certainly supported the idea, but uh, I can't take credit for it. Thank you, sir. You're welcome, sir. Do we have any questions from the chat room? In the meantime, anyone else? Do we have more questions? No questions from the Zoom folks, okay? Well, Admiral, thank you so much for, for appearing. We have enjoyed immensely your presentation and for the edification of the people in the audience, it is Naval tradition when an Admiral comes on board a ship that he is accorded bells commensurate with his rank. And as a full Admiral, you would rank eight. And I would note the President of the United States rates eight as well. And when an Admiral departs, there are eight bells struck on the ship's bell to signify his departure or her departure these days. So yes. ding, 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 ding. Admiral, United States Navy departing. <laughs>